Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are in the world. And thank you very much for joining us today. For the past few days, the CUGH conference has hosted several engaging conversation with experts from around the world discussing crit critical gaps in global health and development. My name is Agnes Binaguao, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity based in the rural north of Rwanda, the country from where I'm honored to continue this conversation with you all today. Joined by leading global experts from across Africa to discuss challenges that the continent face and potential solution moving forward. Among the challenges I see facing the African continent is the inequity in research funding, partnership and incentive system for African researchers. Africa accounts for 12% of the global population, but contributes only for 1% to the research output. Partnerships are not always mutually beneficial and continue to explore sometimes issues that are not the priority for the continent, with partners from the global north making the top-down decision. And many researchers in Africa are not allocated time or compensation or initiative for research and instead are expected to do research on top of their duty full-time for the health sector. Moreover, research grants often focus on one-time project rather than sustainable investment in building research capacity. Joining us in this, the discussion of these and other challenges of the continent, of the African continent, are Dr. John Gengasong, Dr. Thalen Mofuken, and Dr. John Amwasi. I will give you a brief introduction to those eminent speakers, brief because <laughs> they deserve much longer in illustrious bios, but we are going to win time for the Q&A. Dr. John Gengason currently serves as the first director of the Africa Center of Control Disease and Prevention, known as Africa CDC. He is a leading virologist with nearly 30 years of work experience in public health. Prior to his appointment with the Africa CDC, he was the deputy principal director of the Center for Global Health at the United States Center, Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, an associate director of the laboratory science and chief of the international laboratory branch of the division of global HIV AIDS and TB. Dr. Thalen Mofuken is the United Nations Special Reporter on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. She is a commissioner of the Commission for Gender Equality in South Africa and member of the board of the Safe, of Safe Abortion Action Funds, Global Advisory Board of Sexual Health and Wellbeing Accountability International. She is a medical doctor with a great expertise advocating for universal health access, HIV care, youth friendly services, and family planning. Our third, last but not least, speaker is John Amwasi. He lectures at the Global Health Department School of Public Health, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. He is the executive director of the African Research Network for Neglected Tropical Disease. He is group leader of the Global Health and Infectious Disease Research Group at Kumasi Center for the Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine, which hosts the African Research Network for Neglected Tropical Disease. Dr. Amwasi is the, front, uh, is the forefront of global efforts toward addressing emerging and re-emerging infectious disease 
and serve as an executive committee member of the African Coalition for mm. Epidemic Research Response and Training. Each of our three eminent panelists will present their view on the challenges facing the African continent in global health and development during introductory statements. And we will discuss potential solution during a Q&A session discussion after the introductory words. Please do not hesitate to using the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of your screen to ask any question and name the panelists to whom you address them. Don't forget that we have two eminent John, so specify to which John you address your question. Dr. John Gegasong, let's start with you. Could you give us your view on this topic? So I think you can now hear me. Can you can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, good. I mean, I mean, I was on mute. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I was asked to come in on briefly for five minutes or less on the challenges to regional collaboration in global health and development. Let me uh, approach that from two key words: uh, global health and and development. First of all, um, from some basic definitions. I mean, uh, global health deals with the health of the, uh, the entire population, and it deals with uh, equity in, in health for all. We have, however, often frame public uh, global health in a, a slightly different manner, if you ask many people, before COVID. I'll come back to COVID later, where it, global health is often narrated or implied as the health of people in, in less developed world. And uh, so when you sit somewhere in the developed world and you say you're a global health expert, it means you are doing some work maybe in Cameroon or Nigeria and or Asia, okay? And it's not necessarily in the, those developed parts of the world. Uh, COVID-19 has actually taught us that uh, maybe we should be looking at it differently, that health is global and not, not really global health because uh, COVID-19 has flattened the curve and it has actually uh, taught us that the so-called invest uh, care law, which was uh, put, stated in 1971, first published in the Lancet by Julian Hart, which stated that resources are always more available in, in areas that have limited uh, needs of them uh, uh, versus areas that need more resources but uh, have abundance of diseases. I think COVID has flattened that a little. So the point I want to make there is that health is global. And COVID is an example of what it has taught us that in the inequalities that exist, the inequities that exist, the vulnerability that exists, and the connectivity that exists amongst us. Now, in terms of development, we know that a healthy people are a wealthy people. So it's clearly that as we begin to look at global health or health is global, we begin to look at what is the impact of, of good health in the development of people? What is the impact of uh, 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 diseases outbreaks like the COVID we're dealing with in terms of development and the disruption in, this, in development. A good example is uh, Africa's aspiration, where we just this year launched uh, a continental free trade agreement or area. And because of COVID, it's very difficult for us to implement that uh, agreement, that continental free trade agreement. But that is an agreement or that it was supposed to enable the continent to generate billions and billions of, of dollars, uh, uh, developmental dollars going forward. So going forward, we really need, begin to look at, at, at the association, the close association between uh, global health and healthy people and, and development. And also look at it regionally. Okay, what are some of the challenges that uh, must be dealt with regionally? I think Agnes touched on those. Uh, funding for those global health institutions is always limited. Uh, the recognition of uh, research from originating from those uh, regions is always limited. So we begin to look at the regions at, in four different perspectives. What are the similarities that exist within the region that will enable us as a region, be it Africa or Southeast Asia, to identify and recognize the challenges that, uh, that we face as a people in the region? What are the aspirations that are unique in the region? 
what are some of the policies that are unique in the region and what is the politics that is unique in the region. Unless and until we address these, these dimensions, funding and releasing resources and investment in global health in each region will continue to be a challenge for us to uh, meet our own uh, overall aspirations. Let me just conclude my remarks by saying that it is in our interest, collective interest, that we look at global health strictly in the sense of uh, economic dimensions. We look at global health in the, strictly the sense of, of social uh, uh, harm and global health in the sense of security of our people. And I'll maybe take it one step further, which include national uh, 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 security. And not just health security, because COVID is teaching us that these lessons in greater dimensions every day. Let me end here, and I, I look forward to uh, engaging in a very dynamic conversation. Over. Thank you, John, for this insightful presentation of obstacle to the region collaboration collaboration in Africa. Thank you for coming back to uh, differentiate the uh, the global health with the health of developing world that this notion that you are right has been totally changed for those who are blind to that due to COVID. And also to put the good health of all, what concerns global health, in the economic development of our continent. And also the fact that we need to build on our simil similarities and aspiration unique to the region to overcome together our challenges. Thank you. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Tlaland. So Dr. Tlaland, the floor is yours. Thank you so much um, colleagues and, and all the guests joining us this evening. Um, my task um, seemed quite simple, right? Um, but not, not really. Um, and I'm supposed to speak on the double burden of African women, scientists, career development and global health. And this, this became quite personal um, and more uh, personal than I thought it would be um, as I started reading up and realizing that in fact, some of the challenges um, and the pressures that I've experienced in my own career and development as a young black woman in Africa in global health um, is not an isolated experiences. And in fact, some of the learnings um, from, from that experience um, has actually been researched. And I think that's where I, I was encouraged um, to see that in fact, people are paying attention um, to the fact that there is continuous um, disempowerment and disengagement and structural obstacles and challenges um, that African women scientists still face in the global health sector. And I think what was more concerning for me is it's usually we look for the global health space, um, you know, for, for feminist um, ideology and some philosophy, right? Um, that's driving all of us um, to, to, to gender equality and gender equity. And if you look at the sustainable development goals, um, goal number five speaks about gender equality and how will we get gender equality if the very experts themselves um, who are supposed to be leading um, in the work um, and, and, and leading and, and making decisions um, in positions of leadership are experiencing um, continuous structural obstacles and challenges along the way. And um, in, my, in my statement, in fact, to the General Assembly um, in, in 2020, I actually spoke about the importance of not only looking at the impact of COVID-19 um, in a biomedical sense only, and the fact that when many countries around the world were going under lockdown and which was a safety measure, it was actually women in the services and hospitality industries who couldn't remain safe, even though they had wanted to, because most of those industries are still serviced and those positions are still held by women. So even though there was this idea of safety around the different regions, women still experience gender-based violence 
even during the pandemic in their homes as well in as well as in their workplaces the commission for gender equality for example continue to assist many um, um, women and not only women who are you know classified as poor or uneducated but giving women information about what their rights are in the in the workplace and we know that the international um, uh, labor organization has embarked on resolutions around sexual harassment um, and 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 sexual abuse in the workplace so for women right we are not only trying to be scientists and leaders and experts in our own on in our own fields but we are still experiencing the same violence and the same societal pressures and the same um, you know, gender stereotypes, which are not serving us, which continue to disempower us. We face that in every sphere of our lives, including the workspace. And therefore, by extension, in the global health space, we have to interrogate and look um, at some of the structural um, issues that keep women back. And one of the most important, um, I think, issues we can talk about now, you know, it's the health of healthcare workers the mental health and wellness of the workforce, which is mostly women, right? Um, and, and the fact that they are the ones who are essential to ensure that the human rights, the bedrock um, and the essential elements of public health, which are um, availability, accessibility, acceptability and quality of healthcare services for all um, comes to life. And that the right to health is not just an abstract idea that they operationalize the right to health. And I think when you are thinking about the, the workload, right, in many communities on healthcare workers themselves, if you think about their mental health allowances, their remuneration, fairness in the workplace, right, all of the things that are needed for them to be able to, de to deliver a quality service are almost always missing. And yet it's women, again, um, the very scientists when they get home, who are now in charge of taking care of extended family members, who are in charge of, 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 of taking care of the sick people, family members who are sick, to a point where they can't even take care of themselves um, as women. And so there is a study actually that was done that showed um, you know, some of these um, um, challenges, right? That many careers for, for, for women, um, of course, they, they, they differ, the, the, the challenge, challenges between the richer or countries or more resource rich countries versus the lower income countries. But at the end of the day, um, there were pressures that were based on gender, so the, the, the difficulties were gendered, um, and, and some of the challenges included um, that there were structural obstacles, right, about climbing institutional career ladders. Um, there was tension between career and family responsibilities because society is still defining womanhood within certain aspects and still puts us in certain boxes. And therefore there is this continuous tension between being a career woman in global health or, or having these family responsibilities. And the other one, which is really important, it's about the health and safety issues, right? That many women leave the global health space because of gender bias, because of discrimination, because of unfairness, because of racism as well. And I think we've seen in the last um, couple of months how the international NGO space, um, you know, has, has had to confront um, some of the, the, the issues around, you know, microaggression and racism, as well as sexism in the space um, that impacts, right, the ability not only for the, for the global health um, players to deliver on their mandate, but to ensure that the very people themselves who are supposed to deliver that mandate have their own rights firstly protected and promoted so that they can, by extension, then do the same and advocate in the communities where they serve. I will stop here. Thank you very much, May Agnes. Thank you, Lalen, for sharing your thoughts on the double burden of African women in their career development. <clears throat> the lesson you share with us extracted from your personal life as an African woman researcher uh, express really how the lack of 
gender equity is an obstacle to the SDGs that contain gender equity as an indicator. And also the inequities women are experiencing vis-a-vis -vis diseases and the gender stereotype that is employ women in general and researcher in particular. And the double daily shift women are doing because after work they have to they have to deliver at workplace they face the domestic work thank you our next speaker is dr john amwasi who will present his introductory statement now Flo oh, is thank your. you very much thank you very much uh Agnes and uh, fellow panelists um dr nkanga song and uh, Dr. T, I was just reading up on you and I hear you're called Dr. T. And I really love that. And thank you so much for um, those really insightful um, comments. It, it's really exciting having listened to both of you because um, what I plan to speak about does touch on a couple of these things. And I think it, it, it just shows um, that these things are worthy of a critical attention. Um, I I think that before we even begin to talk about the challenges that Africa faces in global health and development, and that's the area I was asked to comment on, we need to take a step back and uh, talk about who historically has been providing the narrative on global health and development. I think this is just as important as the question on what the challenges Africa faces are. And when it comes to global health in Africa, the narrative has often centered around the disproportionate burden of malaria, HIV, AIDS, and TB, neglect of tropical diseases, and uh, the, the disparities which are the heart of these uh, diseases. Uh, but this is also reflected in the opportunities available for posing important uh, scientific questions which are needed to address uh, the global health and development of the continent. I think it's really interesting to note, um, uh, and if we take a close look at the voices in global health, you would realize that there is a disparity right in there. Uh, and Dr. T, you did make, make a categorical mention of the, uh, the disproportionate voices of women as, as leaders in global health um, and what that means for our true understanding of global health as well, well as understanding of what the real um, issues are. So there is a mismatch of voices at different levels. And this mismatch needs to be looked at scientifically and addressed uh, head, head first. I think one of the major challenges that we face in Africa is our ability uh, to pursue a truly integrated approach when it comes to global health instead of a disease specific approach. And to do this, uh, we need to focus on what I call the core of global health issues in Africa, uh, what we may refer to as the fundamental causes. And many of you may be familiar with the fundamental cause theory uh, as put forward by Lincoln Fillon initially in 1995 and a big fund of that theory, and which is essentially poverty and disparities. And, and more than anything else, I think it's the disparities that really bring to the fore issues in global health. These disparities are not limited to Africa. You look in, in, in the US and really the disparities that you see, look in the UK, it's disparities that you see. And, and if anything at all, COVID has shown us that these disparities are real and they'll show themselves up uh, when you look at the burden of disease and more importantly, the outcomes uh, from, from the disease. We've come a long way in understanding, but there's a whole lot we still do not know. And so the application of what, what uh, we know as social anthropologic research methods to investigating poverty and these disparities, uh, which will then inform the implementation of disease control and elimination efforts, both for communicable and non-communicable diseases and injuries will be critical. Second, uh, the, the root insertion of COVID-19, I'm sure we'll have the chance to discuss this into an already complicated health equation, means that rather than later, rather now than later, uh, and for a very long time to come, we'll need to find out how these existing global health challenges are interfacing with COVID at various levels. Uh, two major levels one can think about, one at the medical level, where we're seeking to understand how uh, the endemicity of various diseases like the malaria, HIV, AIDS, and TB, the NTDs, how these impact on the risk for infection, the severity of disease, implications for medical interventions, including the development of diagnostics as we talk about uh, cross-reactivity and other things which could explain 
uh, what we're seeing currently in Africa. It could be a bunch of many things, but we just don't know. It just tells you how much work there is to do. Another level is at the public health level. Well, we need to understand how uh, this pandemic has and continues impact on uh, the efforts that have been put in place to address uh, diseases and how to mitigate this. The third challenge uh, I'd like to make mention of as I conclude is the need for us to address uh, the, the accelerated efforts to bring to the field in Africa, novel medicines, vaccines, and diagnostics. And I'm really proud of the work that uh, Dr. Kangasong and the Africa CDC have done since the um, advent of Ebola, uh, how, how the continent has been primed um, to prepare for disease control um, and also development. Organizations like the African Academy of Sciences really streamlining research efforts, a South-South collaboration, I'm sure we come to this later. These have been critical game changers. And then finally, I want to talk on um, what something that Dr. Nkangasong made mention of, which is the, the tie into development and development indices and, and the value systems. Um, we have a very diverse value system in Africa and value systems are closely tied to global health and global health interventions. How, to what degree have we looked for synergies within our value systems? And what does this mean for what we call true development? I say true development because the developmental indices as they are now are, are skewed against Africa. In fact, it would, it would interest you to know that while we're moving towards a more sustainable planet, a lot of these activities, actually, if we should maintain the status quo when looking at economics and the growth of economies, is actually inimical to Africa, and, and this needs to be addressed really quickly. I'll give you a stark example, which I, I love, and I quote from the Desgupta um, uh, review, um, which is, it just gives an example of how the forests in Africa and also in the Amazon, South America, the value of these forests is almost zero until the trees are cut down. And as soon as those trees are cut down, automatically economic value pops up for that wood. This is just an example of so many other economic systems and values which are skewed against Africa, which will require a total global over overhaul, which will have important implications for global health. I'll stop right here and want to thank you again for the opportunity. Look forward to continuing the discussion. Back to you, Prof. Agnes. Thank you, John, for this engaging presentation of the challenges in research and how we need to focus on poverty and disparity in Africa and elsewhere, but also how the challenges uh, of COVID uh, intersect with pre-existing pre challenges and the, the fact that we need to accelerate in Africa the introduction of innovation and constantly question our value in economics. Thank you. So I think we got extremely interesting uh, presentation from our panelists, but before to drive into the discussion session, I want to remind everyone again that you can send your question through the Q&A function on the Zoom. And I can see that uh, we have a first question sent by Kate. Uh, how can organization assist when requested the strengthening of public ministries in health, finance, justice, etc. Uh, and yes, etc. So uh, that will, with the objective to augment the capacity of nation to deliver in public services. So I'm going to throw the question to the three of you. So I will start with you, uh, John Gengasson. You oh, thank you. I can, no, he, no, 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 I, hear, I, hear, I, I had a question, but let me be sure that I, I'm answering the question. I think they, if I understood clearly, the question is how do you work with the ministries of finance, health, justice to address uh, public health uh, 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 issues or challenges is that was that the question yes, yes. and we can focus on research uh, because okay. it's the topic and challenges for the continent yes i, I think <clears throat> that first of all uh, uh it, it's a, a topic maybe uh, that requires 
a whole afternoon discussion on, on, on the research. I think the first thing, let, let me start with the research as a product and then move backward and then find the stakeholders. So everyone African that you talk to recognize that we need to do our own things. That is, you need to develop your own drugs, you need to develop your own vaccines and, and therapeutics, et cetera. Uh, but all of that means you have to invest in research, the research that will lead to that that development, right? Because those things don't just come, you don't just ask. And many times here at the African Union, I've been challenged by people. They say, wait, why are you asking for vaccines from, uh, why don't you develop your, but if you look at the research budget of uh, the various ministries across the entire continent, it extremely, it's almost uh, uh, like it's a favor to those, uh, the research institutions. It's like, okay, we'll give you a little bit of some change for you to do some research and, and then, then secondly, the, 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 the home of good research is academia, university settings. That's where innovation starts. That's where you create innovations. And then, I mean, I'm trying to distinguish between science and, and, and technology, translating science and technology. That's where the, the whole thinking starts there, but it's terribly underfunded in, in Africa, the research components to the extent that the universities have now reduced themselves to a, a, a high school where you just provide some lectures and you teach and, and you, 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 you perhaps uh, 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 follow a, a syllabus and then you graduate students there. But the research component is, is really them. So in other words, if you want some products, the research products, we need to incentivize that space, consider that space as a critical priority. And I'll just add that no country in the world develops without focusing on research. You cannot, if you don't focus on research, you don't innovate. And if you do not innovate, you cannot develop. And that is just as simple as that. So let me then walk backward and say, where is the interface between the Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Health, Ministry of, and now at one block there, the assembly, the parliament. I mean, if all three or four do not come together, so in other words, if the Ministry of Education or uh, uh, Research takes a budget to parliament, and the parliament sees research like a luxury for that, you continue to spin our wheels in a cycle there. So we really need to broaden and have the whole of government approach in Africa to supporting research so that it can actually feed into a global herd or public herd. Let me use public herd very deliberately. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think you have given a comprehensive answer. There is another question here for you, um, uh, John Amos, uh, Amwasi. Uh, how can health and development aid intervention in sub-Saharan Africa context correct donor dependency and instead foster self-sufficiency through intervention as proposed uh, by the OECD DAC in the 2005 Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. This question is from Paul Kedest. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that question, uh, Paul. Um, it, I, th I think you raise a really important issue and certainly I have um, read uh, Dambisa Moyo's book, um, of course, in the whole arguments around uh, of, the, of, the, of the extremes of Dambi Samoyo uh, versus uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs's views when it come, comes to aid and, and what really the solutions are. Again, I'll ask uh, you to pardon me if you can't hear too well, just let me know. It's raining here. We've already started our rainy season here in West Africa. So I've got some nice rains coming through. Um, but ju just to, to mention, it, it, it is really complicated. Uh, the whole question of aid and how it is situated. Um, I, I prefer to look at it this way, to look at what the gains are for um, the countries that uh, provide this, um, what has been labeled as aid versus what is called aid. If you really look at the benefit that accrues to many of these countries and you do the math, you'd realize that it, it, is, it is hardly any aid at all. Um, which is being given. And if you make comparisons with uh, the spending, which goes into 
uh, some of the, the wars and maintaining the so-called peace in various parts of the world, you begin to question um, the genuineness of some of these um, labeled aid efforts. Now, that, that notwithstanding, uh, I, I, think, I think it's really important to, to recognize the vested interest that some of these um, aid activities uh, reflect for some of these um, aid givers and put that in context when um, talking about aid dependency. Because a lot of the problems which are uh, being addressed um, using this so-called aid are uh, actually problems which are rooted in uh, issues which have been perpetuated by some of these very uh, bodies or countries that provide the aid. Therefore, I'm a big advocate of the holistic view of the provision of aid and the addressing of the, the problems uh, which this aid is intended to address. Um, uh, you can look at it from, from, from different angles, um, whether it is pure health-related aid or what they call development aid from the development partners, um, and, and you, could, you could carve it out different ways. But all I would say is that um, in, in, in addressing these issues, there is a place um, for aid. It must be holistic. And most importantly, the purposes for the aid have to be determined and led by those who we claim uh, are being helped. Unfortunately, the agenda for the aid is set by those who are given the aid. And a lot of the time, I do remember very well, uh, Prof. Agnes, and I make this, this reference to you, I, I do make this reference to my students. Um, at the time I was in Rwanda, you were Minister of Health, and I remember you very clearly uh, very sternly speaking to development partners and telling them that Rwanda was not happy with the approach to what some of the aid, aid they were providing for health and the reporting mechanisms which they requested. And you made it clear that if they were not ready to play according to Rwanda's interest and they could take their aid away, I will never forget uh, that they are here to speak. So there's a place for aid. You are not saying you don't want it, but you're saying that it must be on terms that are useful to the country. And I wish that several other uh, African member states would follow uh, this approach towards uh, dealing with the development partners. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, that's true. Independence uh, needs to be cultivated at the home as well. Tatlin, a question for you here. As a female scientist and human rights activist, you have significant experience advocating for the rights of vulnerable, such as women, refugees, and persons with disabilities. What role do you think advocacy can play in ensuring that government promote and enforce gender equity as a human right? What step can, can we take to make this advocacy efficient? To you. Thank you. Um, look, I think the, um, the biggest difficulty, and it's something that I, I really struggle with, right, is this idea that global health spaces are apolitical, right, um, that these spaces are neutral, which they are not. And so the fact that we still have to be asking the question about how do we bring, you know, gender equity and gender equality um, on, on the table um, tells me that we, we have failed, right? And I think a human rights approach um, is the only way. And that's why I'm so glad that gender equality is part of the sustainable development goals because it puts it as a global agenda um, as opposed to just an issue of you know, feminists in, in, in one corner. And I really think it's important that um, to understand that the, the human rights approach is important um, if you are going to have a sustainable development outcomes. Um, it's very important to address existing inequalities, um, discriminatory practices, and unjust power relations. And one way, of course, of advocating is, is, is to map and, and check where you have allyship um, with people who are in positions of power. Um, and also, I think what's really important 
um, is for people to understand how to use, for example, the systems of the United Nations and the different um, um, you know, treaty bodies that exist, because many governments, um, um, you know, and many resolutions at the UN uh, are, are signed on and ratified by countries, but it doesn't seem that the, the, the human rights and the resolutions and the obligations and the responsibilities that they sign and ratify doesn't trickle down, right? So I think for me, it's about how do you operationalize human rights? How do you make human rights <clears throat> embedded in everyday life, whether it's in policy, whether it's in clinical services, whether it's in gender equality? And, and one way of doing it, of course, is to look at policy makers um, and, and, and see where power lies, because I think that's very important. Um, you need to be very clear in terms of what are you trying to shift? And in most cases, it's who are you trying to shift? Um, and, and, that's, and that's how advocacy works um, on that level in terms of policy. But it's very important to go beyond and, and really also not limit ourselves, right? Um, as we speak about gender equality and forget about, for example, transgender women, right? Or forget about women who are experiencing um, homelessness or women who are using drugs or women who are migrants or, or refugees, because it's only if we are truly inclusive of all of those people who are in vulnerable situations that we can truly say um, we are doing something um, and, 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 and the rewards, right, will ripple down to include all of these people. And I think it's really, really important to make human rights the bedrock, right, of any strategy that we embark on um, and, and really hold governments accountable. I think there's a general lack of accountability, even where there are human rights abuses. And that's why I'm urging people to, to, to actually use the UN and, and use the appropriate, um, you know, um, independent experts to highlight and, 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 and issue um, information on some of the issues that are really of concern, um, because we know the, the obligations to respect, protect, fulfill, right, um, that the governments have around human rights and gender equality is a human rights issue. Because even if you look at the determinants of health, if you look at the issues of gender-based violence and femicide, if you look at the issues of gender pay gap, all of those are human rights issues. Um, and so we need to um, get back to understanding that gender equality is a human rights issue and then advocate using human rights as principles and the bedrock of all our advocacy um, uh, methods and activities. Thank you. Thank you, Tatlen. Uh, Dr. John Kengasong, there is a question here for you. COVID-19 has shown the pivotal role of Africa CDC has played in leading a concerted preparedness and response plan for major crises such as COVID-19 in Africa. Outside of crisis, what role do you think Africa CDC may play in tackling the obstacles to regional collaboration you discussed earlier? Uh, thank you. I, I think the um... Uh, four things, or actually three things, that um, uh, uh, Africa CDC uh, role, key roles that Africa CDC should be playing, should be playing outside of of, of this current pandemic. Uh, hopefully, when the pandemic is is over, and uh, and it doesn't seem like um, we will have that space for co to finish dealing with COVID, then we. We, we tackle another the, the, these diseases do not appear sequentially they appear simultaneously like we, as we speak we have people in drc uh, supporting the government there to deal with ebola <clears throat> we also have people in guinea and of course uh, deploy more than uh, 16,000 uh, community workers across the continent supporting them so the first thing that africa cdc uh, role that africa cdc has to play uh, outside of the context of this pandemic is to work with national institutions and regional institutions so that we can begin to believe in ourselves, believe in the, the, the I can have the I can do attitude of solving our problems using local methods to uh, solving a, a, a local a, 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 a original uh, pro public health problems there. We have the capacity, we have the capabilities, but we have to believe in ourselves that solutions will come from the continent. 
I think that that is one. The second thing that Africa CDC would need to do and promote there is that I will not talk about surveillance. I will not talk about laboratory network. If anyone is waiting for that, please know that I will not comment on that. But the second thing is how do we harness our own assets, probably had assets that exist within each region, within each sub-region. Africa is a continent. I like to, uh, uh, I always joke that Africa is the country continent because if someone says I'm from, a, it's very easy to say this is he's from, he or she is from Africa, which doesn't mean a lot. But if you look at Africa as five countries put together, which each country there represents a region, there are tremendous assets in each region. If you look at West Africa, the Niguchi Institute in, in Accra, Ghana. I mean, I wish that anyone who makes a trip to uh, Accra should go visit Niguchi Institute. We have everything that is required to fight diseases there. You cross over to Senegal, the Pasteur Institute, they produce vaccines. I mean, you, you hop over in Cote d'Ivoire or, or in Nigeria. The key thing we have not done is how do we bring those together so that it can coordinate with, uh, uh, with, um, amongst themselves to support those less privileged uh, 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 countries that do not have those kind of public health assets. That I think is very, very important. When I became the director of Africa CDC four years ago, uh, people would come here and say, well, we need to send, uh, we have uh, scholarships to send Africans to go study in country A, B, C. I say, well, why do you bother? Why do you want to go that far? There are all these institutions in Africa that you can send them to these institutions and you learn exactly what, the same things that you want to send them to study, uh, to go learn over there. The third thing is we have to promote uh, the, the network of the universities on the continent because that is where the creativity will happen. That is where the competence in public health will arise. And that is where we need to also work with universities and bring an entrepreneurial spirit in public health. Okay, implementation. Entrepreneurial spirit in public health implementation. I work at the US CDC, as Ernest mentioned, for, for 25 years. And uh, uh, we started the PEPFAR program uh, uh, together with uh, 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 um, Ambassador Bex, who was the, uh, the coordinator for uh, COVID at the White House before she retired. And uh, we had to use universities as implementing partners. I find it odd that you need a university partner in uh, uh, somewhere else in the world to come to Ghana or Rwanda and be helping in the implementation where you could use the un University of uh, uh, Kumasi. So what essentially happens is that uh, the university comes in from say Atlanta and then with a, a, someone who has the money and then you hire all the local Ghanaians and implement the programs, but then the program is branded as a, this is done by University of X in whatever they have. I have nothing against that. What I'm saying is that African universities, uh, Africa CDC must promote the universities into that lane in Africa and, and push them to be uh, uh, creators, okay? Not just uh, lecturers or conducting science, but move also into the service delivery component, which is implementing projects in the field. And lastly, uh, Africa CDC has to be a champion for um, an, uh, African manufacturing of our own diagnostics, African manufacturing of uh, vaccines and, and research that leads to treatment. Without that, our own health security will continue to be challenged. We will never guarantee the, the health security of our people if we do not do those three things, i.e. Uh, have a continental approach for diagnostics, manufacturing. Uh, as an HIV uh, 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 expert for 29 years, the, the two years ago, I made an analysis and I realized that we do conduct about 100 million HIV tests a year, but there's no rapid test a simple rapid test that is produced in Africa, a simple rapid test. So that is where the interface between research innovation and a central body like Africa CDC promoting development. If we could do that, if you could have a, a, a site in Rwanda, you can see how many people, your young people you, have, you employ, and then you see how much you can rely on your own capabilities to test HIV in, in the country. I'm using Rwanda just as an example. So those are four key areas that uh, besides the traditional surveillance, uh, pandemic response, and laboratory networks, Africa CDC needs to be looking at those things at that level. Thank you. Thank you, John, uh, for this comprehensive uh, uh, answer. Uh, Tatlan, a question for you here. I summarize it, it comes from Candice. Um, are there any programs in Africa that are being implemented in the workplace to make mental health less stigmatized, 
provide education and resources to, to cope with workplace stressors? Absolutely, um, Candice, the answer is yes. Um, there are those programs and many of them, um, and I can speak for South Africa, for example, um, many of the, um, the, the companies get audited um, and as part of the, the audit around, um, you know, um, remuneration and, and um, you know, adherence to the Labor Act. Um, what's also important is that health and wellness of employees um, is something that um, the company has a duty of care to fulfill. And this is more evident, especially in corporate companies, in your mining companies, in your production and manufacturing companies, um, where it's not, you know, the, the issue of uh, PPEs, you know, all of us know now that acronym because of COVID, but many industries have been using some form of PPEs, you know, in terms of the, the safety uh, precautions for, for employees. What I find, and this is a global phenomenon, it's not an Africa issue only, <clears throat> is that the issue of mental health is still not being addressed adequately across the board. I think people take for granted, right, the amount of stress um, it takes um, to actually do the job. And I remember, um, you know, being a young medical doctor myself and having to deal with post um, uh, post-gender-based uh, violence survivors from all ages, right? From neonates up to grannies. And going from that shift to the next shift where you are in ICU and, and doing resuscitations and, and some of them are not successful, right? And then going to the next shift and doing cesareans and, and moving on to the trauma unit. And, and there's something about um, a lack of debriefing, right, that I found impacted me. And I had to go privately to get assistance in order to debrief. And because I realized that I couldn't offer the quality of care to my patients because I was becoming emotionally blunted. I was becoming emotionally unavailable to them, but only because I also had to show up to work in a certain way. Um, when you are working in outpatients department, people are getting tired and annoyed, right? That the queue is so long already. And can you imagine if the nurse said, well, um, guys, just wait another hour. The doctor is crying because she just lost a patient in ICU um, and, and, and she just needs time to cope. You know, people would, would, wouldn't take that. And yet when you see them as a doctor one-on-one -on -one in the consultation, they want that empathy. They want you to be emotionally available, but no one is allowing you that space to be emotional and be available and be present for the, what the job requires of you. So I would say that even in the US, you know, there's a campaign that started where it was to raise awareness around suicide um, in medical doctors because so many of our colleagues, um, you know, um, die um, 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 of suicide. And, and, and there's a campaign of the mixed sock, right? There's the days where you're wearing non-merchant socks. And when people, you know, stop and tell you that, hey, doctor, your socks are not matching. That's a moment for you to advocate and teach people about mental health and the types of different things. But I think what's important around stigma, which is something that Candace brought up, is to integrate mental health and psychosocial support um, into all activities in public health is to also offer information um, that has identified, right, um, any, any gaps, but also existing resources so that when someone then does tell you what their issue is, you are able to map them to a provider. I think many times, many of us, um, especially as clinicians, we, we, we tend to ignore or delay dealing with issues, especially when we don't know where help is coming from. And mental health is something that has not been properly um, advocated for, but planned and resourced for in all of the countries around the world, developed or non-developed, low-income country, rich country, it doesn't matter. And the, the previous uh, special rapporteur actually did a lot of work on mental health, and I'm quite happy um, to share the, the, the OHCHR um, website um, where people can find some of this amazing work on mental health and the, and the um, obligations, right, around dignity and, and privacy and use of non-coercive treatments. So yeah, the, there's a lot that can be said. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tatlen. We are reaching the last five minutes. So Dr. Mercy, the next question is for you, but in one minute, if possible. There is a lot of emphasis uh, on North-South partnership to build research capacity in the Global South. What role do you think South-South partnership can play to increase the contribution of the continent to the global production of innovative tools to promote health on the continent and beyond? To you. No, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Agnes, for that. Um, I think uh, Dr. Nkengasong uh, did broach on this um, in his submissions when he made mention of um, the work that the Africa CDC is doing. I know also in collaboration with the African Academy of Sciences and, and, and others. And he did speak about um, the issues around sending people um, outside of Africa for training on issues uh, for which there is significant competence um, across the continent and for which it would be a better use of time and money and certainly a better experience if that uh, training was, was done uh, within the continent. Uh, this, is, this is changing fairly rapidly. And if you take a good look at leading universities across the continent uh, here in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Nairobi, in Kigali, and other major African um, uh, cities, you would realize that um, there is a growing diversity of um, African scholars from across the continent. Um, I teach medical students and I, I have students from East Africa and students from other parts of West Africa in, in class, uh, including students from Central Africa as well. And, and this has changed significantly from the days when I was in, in medical school. Uh, so this increasing realization of the capacity um, across the continent, but there is a need to be more deliberate about the South-South uh, collaboration and the identification of the capacity. The, the thing about institutions of higher learning, particularly universities, and I'm touching on that because it's really at the heart of what we want to achieve, and, and uh, Dr. Nkengasong did mention this. Uh, the universities shape your way of thinking. They, they shape your ethos and, and, and the way you go about doing your research. And if we are able to get more leading African scientists who are trained on the continent, it shapes their way of thinking in a way that is Africa-centric and is alive to the problems and challenges of the continent. Um, I made a decision, although I did my postgraduate training in the US, everything I did was centered on what I would apply in Africa. As soon as I was done with that, I returned to the continent. I had several choices, but that was my decision because of what I believe in. Um, but many others are not even allowed this option because the training they receive does not gear their minds towards addressing the problems that they have in their own homes, in their own countries. So being deliberate about the efforts, and I know the Africa CDC has started a couple of fellowship programs. I know the African Academy of Science is also working on this, but what I like to see is a greater push on the side of the AU in providing scholarships to institutions of higher learning, redistribute students across the continent, we want to see bright students not only leaving to the Harvards and the MITs and the Emory's, but also going uh, to the KwaZulu Natals and going to the universities of science and technology, Kwame Nkrumah, to the universities of Ghana, to Ibadan, and, and to your university in Rwanda, Prof. Agnes, and several others. I know we, we don't have time, so I'll just stop right here. <laughs> that, uh, thank you, uh, uh, John. So yes, we reached the end of uh, this interesting panel. Uh, and it reminds us that throughout, throughout this past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged healthcare system worldwide, overburdening healthcare staff and infrastructure to a degree we never seen before. Compared to other continent, Africa has managed so far COVID-19 pandemic a little bit better than the Western world with a low number of infected patients and lower uh, uh, case of fatality. It's not by chance, thanks to John CDC uh, and CDC Africa for have putting together our minister before the first case in Africa to agree on a, national, on a continental plan. But if, despite our uh, success uh, in uh, this response, we have a lot of limitation and you have uh, discussed this. Gender equity, yes. 
uh, the capacity of the continent to produce the tools to fight a disease like COVID-19. Yes, when we have the opportunity, we should found investment to do that and interest our private sector to make money with selling uh, African, African made uh, in, in, um, in Africa. And the research, there is a lot of question that were there that were not, uh, uh, um, uh, we didn't get the opportunity uh, to ask, notably uh, about the disparities, the disparities between the high income country and low income countries, the disparities inside country with the lack of data disaggregation, uh, but one hour is uh, really uh, too short. And uh, I like what we have done. Uh, another idea is question on vaccine. Uh, we need to start uh, creating, building, fabricating vaccine at a cheaper price and do that on the continent to serve more people. We also need to continue building research capacity to ensure that African countries are able to significantly discover drugs and vaccine in the future for future pandemic. So thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tatlen. I thank all the participants to this panel. And um, uh, it's a discussion to be continued. One hour is too little for a big continent like ours. And thank you for CGH to have think about this panel. And I'm so happy to have been part of it. Thank you. And bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.